Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our grand rounds today. We'll be getting started in just a moment, so give us a few minutes, and then we'll go ahead and get started and have Dr. Janice start speaking. All right. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our first Grand Rounds of the Year. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that classic articles from PRS and PRS Global Open were chosen to complement this lecture and are available for free online at prsjournal.com and prsglobalopen.com on the homepage. I also want to thank everyone here for participating in this Grand Rounds, as well as our past Grand Rounds. This event has helped us win multiple national awards, and it's all thanks to you for participating. All of our past lectures, Q&As, and accompanying article collections are available on prsjournal.com on the Grand Rounds archive. And finally, I want to encourage everyone watching this video to post their questions by commenting on the Facebook Live video throughout the lecture. Q&A will begin immediately after the lecture, and Dr. Janice will answer as many questions as he can. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Janice as our speaker tonight. Dr. Janice is a professor of plastic surgery, surgery, neurology, and neurosurgery here at Ohio State. He's chief of plastic surgery at the University Hospitals, the past ASPS president, and a great mentor to myself and all of the residents here at Ohio State. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Janice so we can begin his discussion of the surgical treatment of headaches. Thank you, Casey. It's an honor and pleasure to be here for PRS Grand Rounds, and thanks for all of you taking some time out of your busy days and practices to learn a little something about nerve decompression surgery for headaches. Uh, before we get started, I just want to recognize that uh, uh, there's a lot going on in this world, and um, it's uh, it's really important for us to stay together and um, and learn a little something uh, in more ways than one. So, uh, with that tonight, we're going to focus our attention on nerve decompression surgery for headaches. Uh, and as Casey said, we will save a lot of time at the end for Q and A. Um, I do have disclosures, none of which will affect this presentation. I also want to make mention that I put all of my peer-reviewed references at the bottom of the slides. And as Casey said, um, there are some archived uh, articles uh, that are available to you uh, through the PRS website. Um, migraine headaches is a very disabling disorder. Um, for those of you who are tuning in and wondering where you might find patients if you're interested in this type of surgery, my answer to that question would be simple that they're already there. Um, for those of you that didn't know, 35 million Americans uh, actually have or suffer from migraine headaches. That's 18% of women, 6% of men. And actually, if you take a look at cumulative lifetime prevalence, uh, for instance, in women, um, at least 43% of women have had at least one migraine in their life. Um, so I'll bet you if I asked anybody here to raise your hands, if you uh, either have migraines yourself or know of somebody who has them, I'll bet you everybody here would raise your hand. So um, if you're asking where are these patients going to come from if you're interested in incorporating this type of technique into your practice, um, the answer is, is you probably need to go back and review the past medical history of almost any patient that you've already seen uh, because chances are they're already there. Um, it is a very disabling disorder. It's responsible for a lot of visits to the hospital, to the clinic, to the emergency departments. It's responsible for a lot of prescriptions written. Um, and, and again, for those of you that may not know, it's more common than asthma and diabetes combined. So these patients are in your practice and they're suffering and they're looking for solutions. Now, if you go to your textbook of neurology, and matter of fact, if you went today, let alone 20, 25 years ago, um, you wouldn't see a whole lot about the surgical treatment of this disorder. Rather, you'd see uh, really how it's based on the premise of medical management. And that's what primary care physicians, family physicians, neurologists are largely doing is using medical management uh, in order to treat these patients. 
Now, I will say that there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, let me be clear. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Matter of fact, that's the first line, front line type of treatment uh, for these types of patients. The question is, is what do you do if those types of treatments don't work? Uh, where do they turn? Uh, where do the patients turn? Where do the neurologists turn? Um, and these patients who are traditionally helped by medications, um, oftentimes these medications only soften some of the symptoms rather than uh, get rid of them entirely. Um, these do affect patients, uh, especially those with chronic disabling headaches. These patients basically live their lives either having a headache or waiting for the next one to happen. And let me assure you that this doesn't just affect one person, one patient. This affects everyone who loves and supports these patients as well. It is very rare in my practice, especially on the first initial new patient visit, to have only one person in the room at the time, that being the patient. Most often, and I would argue more than 95% of the time, they are supported by somebody else who's sitting right next to them who is almost equally as affected uh, as these patients are by these headaches. These patients uh, basically um, really don't have a lot of options by the time they find you, uh, and uh, you are uh, a hope to them, which uh, needs to be accounted for. Um, there's no talk these days that can really uh, be had without discussing economic consequences. Uh, before the pandemic, um, these numbers used to be large. Now they're uh, fairly small, but relatively speaking, um, these are still big economic consequences uh, to the impact of migraine headaches on patients and on society. Now, if you look at how traditional treatments uh, have been divided up, you can basically divide them up into abortive and preventative. The abortive uh, treatments are those that are designed to stop a headache once it's already begun, whereas preventative treatments are uh, designed to try to stop headaches before they begin at all. Now, if you were to look at some of these medications here, and I have no uh, conflicts of interest, I pointed that out already, I have no affiliations with any of these companies, um, but if you take a look at the names on the left are the generic names and on the right are the brand names. These are some examples of abortive uh, treatments. Again, these are medications that are designed to relieve a headache once it's begun. And if you take a look at some of the treatments here on this page, which are the preventative examples, you'll see that there are examples of calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, anti-seizure medications, et cetera, antihypertensives. There's a lot of medications. What does this tell me? This tells me that we don't know the one right medication or the one right way to treat these patients because if we did, then I would have one slide with one bullet point on it and would say one thing and we would all be doing it and patients would be helped by that. So the fact that there's a laundry list of examples speaks to the fact that we don't know exactly everything about this, but we try. So when you take a look at some of the disadvantages of some of these traditional treatments, you do have to take these on a regular basis. Um, even if you have insurance, they still cost money and they do take time to take effect. Um, I recall one patient that I had um, that was on a cruise with her husband um, and she was out on deck and she got that aura, that sensation that she was about to have a mind splitting migraine headache. So she asked her husband if he would do her a favor and run down to the cabin to get that uh, migraine medication for her. And by the time he, he literally ran down uh, to the uh, cabin and ran back on deck, uh, it was too late. The headache already blossomed. It was a seven day cruise. And she spent the next four and a half days with the curtains drawn, the lights off and in her cabin. That was no way to spend a well-earned one week uh, cruise vacation. Um, so uh, it, it does make a difference, some of these uh, disadvantages. In addition, there are some side effects and uh, these side effects can be undesirable. And besides that, there can be situations where these uh, medications can't be taken. Uh, my wife has migraines, so we have three small kids. Um, and I can tell you when she was pregnant, um, there was a, a significant limitation on the medications um, that she could take. Um, I will tell you, acetaminophen is not going to cut uh, a massive migraine headache when you have it. So um, medications may work in most situations. There are some examples where it, it may not. So what do patients do? They turn to al alternative forms of treatment. Most of these patients that are coming to see you have chronic debilitating migraines. They have seen a host of physicians. Um, they have tried uh, almost everything in this list, if not more. So they've looked under a lot of rocks before they get to you. Uh, and now you're representing, again, one of the last hopes, usually one of the last rocks that people look under uh, to look for some sort of relief. So we're going to focus this talk uh, on the bottom three. Um, botulinum toxin, nerve blocks, and surgery. I should make mention that 
in my um, conflict of interest slide, you did see I was a consultant for Allergan. Allergan uh, does make Botox. My conflict of interest, though, I don't have anything to do with that uh, part of the company. So again, I want to just be very transparent and clear that, um, that there's no influence on this presentation. Um, no talk on this type of subject can be had without giving credit where credit is due. This is Dr. Baum and Guyron from Cleveland, Ohio. I went to medical school at Case Western Reserve. I was a medical student. He was a full professor there, uh, and he's a pioneer in many things, including this, uh, which is uh, migraine surgery. Um, and he would tell you the story, uh, if he were here right now, that the way he fell upon this was almost by serendipity or luck. Um, he basically had a patient in whom he had done a cosmetic brow lift. Um, she came to see him a week after surgery. She was extremely pleased with the cosmetic outcome, but she was even happier with the fact that her migraine headaches were gone. Now, he would admit to you that uh, he kind of blew that off. Uh, that was one point on the curve. He hadn't noticed or heard that before from any other patient. But yet a week later, he had another second patient in whom he had done the same operation that came back and told him the same thing. He's a very inquisitive guy. He's a, a surgeon scientist. Um, and he started wondering what could be going on during a cosmetic brow lift that would have relieved anybody's headaches. And certainly it wasn't because the eyebrow was just a few millimeters higher. That didn't make sense. Um, so his concept at the time was that maybe this was like carpal tunnel syndrome of the head. Now, carpal tunnel syndrome of the wrist is where we have the median nerve, which is pinched, irritated, compressed, or entrapped by a ligament here in, in the wrist. And we usually address that with surgery. Um, the thought here is that there are muscles in a brow lift that one removes so that you can remove or soften the wrinkle lines here in the central forehead. And if you remove the, it's called the corrugator muscle, if you remove the corrugator so it doesn't pinch on the nerves, then maybe that would relieve the pain or pressure of a headache sensation. So again, the thought is, is that in these cosmetic brow lifts, it's not altering the brow position that made a difference. It was by removing muscles with, that were thought to pinch nerves that would have relieved somebody's pain. The only issue is, is that these nerves are what's called peripheral nervous system nerves. So these are not how we would read in the uh, neurology books um, that, that uh, uh, are the phenomenon that occur with migraine headaches, which are thought to be centrally mediated phenomenon. In other words, the brain and spine, in particular here now the brain. So things like cortical spreading, depression, or release of substance P, C, G, R, P, these are all things that we know happen uh, in the brain during a migraine headache. But now we've got Dr. Guyron coming along saying, well, that all might be true, but the triggers can actually start outside of the brain. They can start in the peripheral nervous system and connect somehow to the central nervous system. I'll show you a little bit later uh, the data behind that. So the first order of business for him was to say, well, how long has this been going on under my nose without me being aware of it? So he actually looked back and sent questionnaires to 314 patients whom he had done a cosmetic brow lift on and found that of those patients who also had migraines, he actually was helping 80% of those patients with this type of surgery and had not known it the entire time. The issue though, is that you can't walk around and uh, use the knife on everybody who's got a headache. That doesn't make much sense. So how do we trick the body into thinking that the migraines, or excuse me, how do you trick the body into thinking that the muscles are gone when you actually don't really remove them? Now, Dr. Guyron was one of the earliest pioneers on the cosmetic use of Botox. He was doing this in the late 80s, early 90s. And so he thought, how do we trick the body into thinking the muscle isn't there? Why don't we paralyze it with Botox? And if that stops the muscle from pinching the nerve and somebody, some patient's pain goes away, well, then that may be of benefit and that may mean that they may be a surgical candidate. So this was uh, involved very early on in the diagnosis of what's called trigger sites. Now, what are trigger sites? These are typical locations that patients have, usually periorbital, temporal, occipital, so around the eye, the temple, the neck, where patients typically have pain. And we know that there are nerves in those areas. But what wasn't known at the time was how do they bob and weave and twist and turn through tissues? Where might they be compressed or irritated or entrapped? That was the subject of our translation anatomical research that was done over a period of time, looking at all of these trigger sites. So just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into great depth. I would encourage you to read the articles that Casey talked about that are available at the PRS and PRS Global Open website. 
But what you have here are these major trigger sites. And we used to think it was just muscle that was the source of compression, but it's not just muscle. It's actually bone, fascia, blood vessel, in some cases, cartilage. We used to call these other uh, uh, trigger sites minor trigger sites. We don't think that any longer. We've learned over time that these trigger sites are just as important as the ones that I pointed to earlier. So there are many uh, sources of potential pain that need to be investigated when working these patients up. Now, you really can't do this type of surgery unless you understand the anatomy. That goes for any type of surgery for that matter, but especially true uh, in nerve decompression surgery. And so let's go through uh, maybe these sites one at a time. Let's uh, first start uh, at frontal for 500. So I'm showing you a picture of a patient, um, uh, and you've got him here getting injected with Botox. I want to describe what I'm doing here. This, just to be clear, is an on-label indication because in October of 2010, the FDA approved the on-label use of Botox for chronic migraine headaches, but it is an off-label injection pattern. Patients don't like to be stuck with needles. I don't like to be stuck with needles, okay? This is a 30-gauge needle, one inch long, and I'm injecting in three points, okay? And I'll show you in a, in a slide that this is far less uh, injections than what the FDA on-label recommendation is. And my point is, is that you could use targeted Botox placed right in the right place because you understand the anatomy that can get you the chemodenervating effect on the corrugator that you're looking for. I use a four to one dilution that's four cc's of preserved saline in one vial of 100 units of Botox. Uh, again, it's on label um, uh, for this indication. Um, and in this case, I am using a 30 gauge one inch needle and I'm injecting 25 units total to both corrugators. And it's a three point injection technique. So the central injection here in the glabella is uh, oriented obliquely because it's following the corrugator and then we'll inject two from the sides. Don't forget that centrally, uh, the origin of the corrugator is going to be about three millimeters lateral to the midline. It's going to be deep on the periosteum, so your needle should be deep. And then when you angle it obliquely, don't forget it inserts on the subdermis of the lateral brow. So not only are you angling the needle superior laterally, but it's rising from deep to superficial. And that's how you make sure you get the proper injection. Now, I told you earlier that I would challenge the assertion that you need two to three vials of Botox and the FDA is recommending 31 uh, injection points in a headband-like pattern around the head, over the top of the scalp, down the neck, across the shoulders. And while that may work, and that is based on science, my contention here and what we've published is that you can use less Botox, less injections, and get at least the same effect. So here in the upper slide, and I'm going to go back to this slide here, you're going to see that this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is what on the top row, these are the FDA on-label injection patterns. So here's seven different injections for that frontal trigger site where you just saw in that video three. I'll show you here in a second that the on-label uh, injection pattern is four sites in the temporal region where we can hit that in one. And you can count how many dots here in the occipital we can hit that in two. So bottom line is, is that targeted injection is going to make a difference. Now, when I was, and this is a little bit of a thought journey here, when I was taught this and when I learned this back in uh, 2001, 2002, um, everything was being done 100% endoscopically. Um, but as we knew more anatomy, we came to understand that there was pathology on the orbital rim. Now, you can see here, this is a patient uh, who's supine waiting for an endoscopic approach uh, to decompress the supraorbital and supratrochlear, and for that matter, the zygomaticotemporal nerve. The incisions typically would be five, and they would be just behind the hairline. So you'd have one in the center here, then one uh, about seven centimeters lateral to that in the, in the uh, paramedian area, and then three centimeters lateral to that one in the temporal region, you'd have another incision. Okay, and you'd bridge the temporal fusion line in between. So what you have here are five injection sites, one in the center, two where your horns would grow, and two on the temples. So that's five. Now, if you had a male who had a prominent forehead or you have somebody who has a long forehead, you might split this center incision into two. That would be six. Um, but the object is, is how do you get from here all the way down to the supraorbital rim and address a lot of the pathology that could be present on the supraorbital rim? That's where we started to transition to different uh, uh, approaches. Now, this is just an example of what an endoscopic approach looks like. 
removal of the corrugator, skeletonization of the superorbital. Here you see the deep and superficial branches. You see some back grafting with non-vascularized fat from the deep temporal fat pad. That's what that looks like endoscopically. My issue was I was having trouble really decompressing and in some cases doing what's called a superorbital foramenotomy. So decompressing the nerve if it's surrounded by a circle of bone. That's hard to do completely endoscopically. So I was making these very limited counter incisions. So here you can see through this very limited, and again, this is a elastic uh, distensible skin. You know, you don't need big incisions here to get this little counter incision where you can visualize the nerve and have a more uh, accurate approach to a foramenotomy if you need. You see that what, what it looks like here on the left, not very conspicuous at all. This is what I started to shift towards. But now where I'm at is 100% open, at least for the superorbital and supertrochlear nerves. These are some clinical examples from some of my patients. Um, these are upper eyelid incisions. It's direct access. Think kind of like subtarsal approach to orbitozygomatic fractures uh, versus subciliary approach. Um, it actually it heals very well. It's still in the thin eyelid skin, so it heals very favorably, very quickly. Um, but again, because of the distensibility of the skin, you could really get some good exposure, and you can not only see the nerves and the vessels and the fascia and the bone, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a much uh, a technically less demanding operation, and you don't need endoscopic equipment. So again, these are just some clinical examples of what that might look like. So uh, Rob Haben, Hagen, Mike Falucco, and I uh, took a look at this and termed it superorbital uh, rim syndrome. Again, this is taking a look at what a direct approach to address superorbital rim pathology might look like. Here's some examples from the paper. You can read it in PRS Global Open. Uh, and don't take my word for it. This is the data that we found. These are MIDAS scores, uh, which is a questionnaire that evaluates disability. It's just like golf, low scores are better. So you can see here that preoperatively, these patients had some significant disability because of their pain. And afterwards, in both the short and the long term, their MIDAS scores are lower, indicating significant improvement. So with direct approach to the supraorbital rim, you're seeing some benefit. And for those of you that want to use fat, um, you could either use non-vascularized uh, fat parcels, or you could even use what we use in upper blepharoplasty, except we sometimes remove the fat. In this case, this is a transposition of vascularized fat coming from the upper eyelid, which you can use to backfill the area of the corrugator resection so there's no contour depression or divot, uh, and also surround and cushion the nerves that you just skeletonized. So that would that, that's what that would look like clinically. Now, um, this, again, is more than just one magician in Cleveland or any other city that, uh, for that matter, that can perform this. This is Jay Austin's group out of Boston, who, again, published in PRS in 2014. Uh, their series of 43 patients in whom they had done these open approaches to this trigger site um, with at least one year follow-up, and they had statistically significant benefits uh, uh, to that in terms of uh, improvement off of baseline. So again, um, published peer-reviewed data. Let's shift to the temporal region. And what I want to tell you here is that back when we first began and we asked the most important question of these patients, which is, where does your pain start? It used to be acceptable that patients would just take their palm and just basically put it right here on their temple, and that was sufficient. The reason why that's not sufficient anymore is because you have nerves that are in the same vicinity that are very close to each other. So in this study, which we looked at the zygomatic good temporal branch of the trigeminal nerve, what we basically found uh, was that, as a matter of fact, I'll show you this here, is that if Simon says you go ahead and, and put your finger on your lateral orbital rim and just drift off to the side, you're going to feel a little minor, minor hollowing or depression right here. That is where the zygomatic and temporal branch of the trigeminal nerve is. So that is where you're going to target that. And now some people like Jay Austin's group like to uh, go through the lateral extension of an upper eyelid incision and do that open. My preference is to do this endoscopically through two incisions here in the temple. Uh, but the bottom line is that you can address this nerve either open or endoscopic. Again, my preference would be endoscopic. Um, how do you inject it? Well, you just uh, feel that little minor hollowing, uh, and I'll show you an example here through this video. Again, this is a 30 gauge one inch needle. Um, this particular gentleman is bald, but if he had hair, this would be just anterior to the sideburn or the temporal hairline here. 
you're injecting your needle at a 45 degree angle. You're getting that haptic feedback from piercing the temporal uh, temporalis fascia. You're angling towards that minor hollowing, which is represented underneath my left thumb here. Um, and you're injecting, in this case, 18.75 units of Botox. Now, again, if you're performing a block, you're going to be using a less and you'll be using 1% lidocaine uh, with or without epinephrine. In this case, I'm injecting Botox, but either w whatever's in your syringe, the technique is the same. The only thing I would caution you is that you do not want to put that needle against the bone or inject it in between the temporal temporalis muscle and the temporal fossa. And that's because a micro droplet of the Botox can actually get in through the foramen uh, through which the zygomaticotemporal nerve emerges. And the first it's the thing it's going to encounter is the lateral rectus muscle of the extraocular movement muscles. And that can weaken that muscle and cause diplopia. So to stop that whole domino effect, just make sure that the tip of that needle is firmly in the body of the temporal uh, temporalis muscle. So like I said, this used to be clumsy, okay? This is the zygomaticotemporal uh, branch, which we just went, went through. But my index finger right here is the auriculotemporal nerve. So this palm used to cover both, and that's why it wasn't as accurate. We need the most important tool, which is the patient's finger. The most important question, where does your pain start? The most important tool to help figure that out is a finger an index finger, a single index finger. Patients need to be redirected sometimes because they may not know what you're looking for. You're looking for that type of, of, of poignant accuracy. So if they start to give you uh, the palm, so to speak, then please ask them and redirect them and say, I need to really look at this from a finger perspective here. So this is the auricular temporal nerve. Take a listen. So she's pointing with a single finger. And now I'm taking a handheld Doppler and I'm putting it right on that. Okay, so what you saw there was the second most important tool, which is that in the auriculotemporal trigger site, that is usually a combination of the auricular temporal nerve and usually the anterior branch of the superficial temporal artery. So what you're looking for is actually a, a vessel. And that vessel is best detected by the handheld Doppler. So the first tool is your finger, show me where it hurts. The second thing is you give the handheld Doppler, uh, put it right on that point, and uh, I actually give it to the patients at this point, um, rather than me just kind of going where they're pointing with their finger, I just say, put this, this uh, device on where it hurts and don't press too hard because of course we don't want them to occlude the flow um, but almost invariably you will uh, pick up the doppler sound which is a, a good sign that this is a potential source of compression when you address this particular trigger site uh, i do ablations in this area both of the auricular temporal nerve and as also the superficial temporal artery and i don't just cut the garden hose and leave the two ends right next to each other i actually do some dissection underneath the tissues and take out a segment um, and the nerve, I will neurotize into muscle and the vessel, I'll double clip on both ends. So just a little technical point. And finally, the occipital. Now, uh, if you look at the slide uh, of the patient on your left, you see two little yellow dots. Now, Simon says, again, put your finger uh, on your occipital protuberance, go down three centimeters and over one and a half centimeters. And that's where the emergence of the greater occipital nerve comes out from the semispinalis muscle. Um, that is a good source of uh, where you may want to inject either blocks or Botox that will be modified again by the finger. What you're seeing in the video is a 27 gauge one and a quarter inch needle. Now that is slightly bigger and slightly longer than the 30 gauge one inch that we were just using. The reason why I'm using that is because it is longer and this nerve is deeper. So uh, in order to get that, this is not a superficial injection. You literally would need to hub that 27 gauge needle and you go three down, one and a half across and it's modified by where the patient puts their finger. And that's because Ivan Duchik here uh, determined in his study that you can have 40% asymmetry of these nerves side to side. So again, uh, these are surface anatomy landmarks, but they're modified uh, on a patient uh, specific basis. Um, so when we looked at, at the original data that came out about how successful we were on decompressing this nerve, 
uh, we were seeing an improvement at least 62% of the time. That was published in 2005. The question is, is could we do better? So we actually, you know, went back to the lab. It, it, it's kind of this age old question, like with carpal tunnel syndrome, what's the most common cause of recurrent carpal tunnel syndrome? It's usually incomplete decompression at the uh, index operation. So using that strategy, we went back to the anatomy lab and we said, well, what are we missing here? Are we getting all of the points in comp of compression? Or is this like other upper extremity compression syndromes where there could be multiple anatomical uh, sources of compression? And sure enough, we found that what we thought was only one single point of compression, which was that yellow circle, that actually was the midpoint. That was point number three of what turned out to be six points of compression. For the sake of time, I'm not going to review that here. I'd encourage you guys to read the article. The bottom line is it's not just muscle. It's also fascia, blood vessel, uh, et cetera. So, you know, th there are um, anatomical features that need to be investigated during a thorough decompression of the greater occipital nerve. Um, this recent study was presented last year uh, at uh, ASPS's plastic surgery, uh, the meeting. Uh, and I will tell you, this is a great paper, it was again performed by Jay Austin's group in Boston, um, where they investigated intraoperative findings and they found that there was indeed intraoperative uh, macroscopic pathology, either with the nerve or with the tissues that surround it, thickened fibrotic fascia, et cetera. So again, uh, it's, it's a soft tissue compression of these nerves that need to be evaluated intraoperatively. Now, again, for the sake of time, we're not going to go in depth here, but we do have the lesser and third occipital nerves to deal with. These blue circles um, uh, uh, are, represent uh, the uh, third occipital nerve, and I, I actually uh, disabled the animation here. These circles would drop down about three centimeters to show you that there is a difference between yellow and blue. Um, so the yellow ones are the greater occipital nerve and the blue ones would be the third occipital nerve. This is an intraoperative photograph showing you that the red vessi loop is around the greater occipital nerve and the blue one is around uh, the third occipital nerve. So again, it's about three centimeters inferior to the greater. This is showing you where the uh, lesser occipital nerve is. The lesser is lateral. So sometimes you can see it through this posterior midline incision. This is the typical traditional incision that we're using to decompress these nerves. But if we're going to go after the lesser, oftentimes this requires a separate incision. And this is just shows you in this patient where we're treating both, how that might look. Um, Dr. Ahmed Afifi from University of Wisconsin recently published this in Global Open as well. This is more of a transverse approach. You can still do fat flap transposition and successful six-point nerve decompression. And again, for additional details, I would encourage you to read this article that was published last year in PRS Global Open. And finally, we'll finish up with the nose that is a fourth uh, trigger site. Um, the uh, key reasons for this could be septal deviation, uh, turbinant hypertrophy, uh, contrabilosa, which is a pneumatized middle turbinant. Um, these are all things that can basically, in the face especially of mucosal engorgement or irritation, can irritate uh, uh, nerve branches of the sphenopalatine ganglion and result in pain. So how do we put this all together? Well, first of all, work with a, a, a board certified neurologist. I, I, I can't emphasize that point enough. Uh, we are plastic surgeons. We are not neurologists. Uh, our job is not to diagnose uh, these uh, headache disorders, but rather to assist those who already have diagnosed these disorders. You don't want to be working up a brain tumor. You don't want to, want to be working up a generic headache patient. That's not within your scope of practice. So uh, I've done this in two different cities successfully. I think the way to do it is approach these neurologists uh, in a very positive, constructive manner. Uh, you can uh, reassure them that you're not after uh, trying to steal patients, but actually rather to supplement uh, these patient experiences and ask for the patients uh, in whom they have tried everything else and they've gotten to the end of the line and it's not been as successful as they wanted to. What do you do then? Are they referring to pain management? Are they referring to another physician? Uh, you know, you can be one of those people who gets these referrals uh, because you could do something about it now that you know more about it. Um, uh, these are the modalities that you're going to use in order to diagnose trigger sites. A constellation of symptoms is nothing but good old-fashioned history and physical exam. That includes the index finger, botulinum of toxin, nerve blocks, CT scans when indicated, which we can discuss during Q&A, and the handheld Doppler. Um, uh, again, you're going to be guided by where does the pain begin. You'll ask questions of the patient. Uh, they may say, I hurt right here. And then you'll ask them, okay, does it stay right there or does it go somewhere else? And they'll say, well, then it goes back here. 
And then you'll say, okay, well, how does it get there? Kind of draw that for me. Um, some will say it just pierces through the head. Some people will say, well, it goes through the temple and then gets back there. And then you may ask another question. Could you ever get the pain back here without getting the pain up here? In other words, can these occur independently? Um, if they can, that implies more than one trigger site. If it's always related, that implies there's a primary trigger site and the rest is a cascade effect. So again, these are very careful questions that you need to ask. Um, for those of you that want to read more in depth about the uh, detection, this is what I would draw your attention to. It's a paper that we published a few years ago. Uh, and uh, again, this has all of the uh, information that we've just discussed, if not more, on how to detect these trigger sites, including constellation of symptoms, uh, Doppler, CT scan, and blocks and Botox. Uh, I'll finish with some uh, publications that I think are worth your while. Uh, I often get questions about what do you do or say uh, when uh, insurance deems these as potentially investigational and experimental. I would say that there has been 20 years of peer-reviewed evidence in high-impact factor journals, um, that, uh, including this paper here, um, which uh, actually proved that this is not experimental or investigational. Uh, this is an IRB-approved sham surgery study that Guyron published. He basically took 75 patients uh, in whom he had worked with a neurologist, properly diagnosed trigger sites, and then in uh, 49 patients, he took those patients to the operating room. He made incisions. He went down. He found the nerves. He did the uh, nerve decompression. He closed the skin, and then he followed them out, and the other 26 patients in the other arm he made the incisions, he went down, he found the nerves, he didn't do anything, and then he closed the skin. The patients were blinded, he was not, because of course he was doing the surgery, and then he followed about, and there was very strong statistically significant evidence that this surgery works because uh, it was far superior uh, outcomes in the true surgery arm than the sham surgery. Now, there are those who uh, read this paper and say, well, I'm not sure that that's entirely true. Uh, there's a placebo effect, and therefore uh, it's back to inv experimental and investigational. Uh, that's why they didn't read this paper, um, which is a five-year follow-up, which basically uh, shows that the longevity uh, can go out to at least five years if you're successful with this operation on the front end. So then the question becomes, okay, well, what do you know in surgery? Actually, wh what do you know in medicine, anything in medicine? where the placebo effect lasts for five years. I would just challenge anybody to answer that question. And, and that's why I think that we uh, don't need to worry about experimental and investigational anymore when you have this kind of evidence. Um, on top of that, um, there have been studies, again, this one's coming out of Cleveland, uh, where they've done proteomic and electron microscopy, uh, microscopy analysis of zygomaticotemporal branch uh, nerves in migraine headache patients versus those who don't have migraine headaches and found a difference in myelinization. In, in particular, there was demyelination uh, in the migraine headache patient cohort. Um, so again, there are ultrastructural differences between these nerves in migraine headaches versus not. And this um, was a fantastic paper. Uh, these are actually a couple of papers that were published by neurologists in neurology journals, which finally represent the missing link. And what they found, especially on some of this cross-sectional histology, was that you were seeing dural fibers that were directly connecting the central nervous system to peripheral. And that was always the disconnect. That was always what was missing. The question was, well, how does peripheral nerve surgery affect what we know to be centrally mediated? How did those dominoes fall together? And they found these in the calvarial um, uh, sutures. So there, you're seeing direct dural fibers going through the calvarial sutures and again, demonstrated very nicely in neurology. Now, this surgery uh, does have socioeconomic benefit. You know, when I bought my HVAC, uh, HVAC system, the way that they uh, told it to me was that, you know, you've got an old system and if you buy this new efficient system, it'll lower your monthly electric bills and it'll pay for itself in nine years. Well, this study was done, which basically shows that this surgery pays for itself in two years. So the bottom line is, is that um, um, this can decrease uh, 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 any utilization of the healthcare system, including healthcare, uh, sorry, uh, prescription medications, visit to healthcare specialists, et cetera. Um, and uh, even though the surgery may cost more upfront, even when covered by insurance, um, this will pay for itself down the line. So people just need to take the long view on it. Um, for those patients that can't undergo or don't want to undergo surgery, we have looked at this. Um, we've looked at basically needle versus knife. And what we found uh, is that with a targeted approach, 
uh, much like what I've talked about earlier, that in those patients who want to stick with, let's say, Botox uh, using this targeted approach, that you're still seeing significant benefit o- over a long period of time. We are not seeing that the same amount of Botox leads to less effect um, or that you need more Botox to get the same effect. Actually, in this long-term follow-up study, we're seeing that targeted Botox can benefit. Now, uh, in all honesty, it's not as good as the surgery in terms of the outcomes, but it is better than nothing and oftentimes represents presents a a nice alternative option that you could offer the patients. Um, For those of you that don't know about it, um, when I was ASPS president, we commissioned a task force uh, that I was not on nor any of my colleagues uh, who do this, uh, but this independent group uh, within the organization uh, looked at all the evidence and science uh, sci- science and came up uh, with a, a recommendation for a position statement which the board of directors adopted uh, in April of 2018 which does say that this is not experimental or investigational but has a preponderance of evidence uh, and that it essentially is a supported surgery it is endorsed so um, this is something you can download off of the website and for those of you that may be dealing with insurance companies um, and may have position statements from other organizations that say that, uh, you know, that, that that's not the case according to this, that, or the other. Um, this is a policy statement that I like to include in my um, pre-authorization letter, uh, which I send to insurance to uh, show them that this has been uh, independently looked at by a third party, is uh, the largest uh, plastic surgery organization in the world. So at the end of the day, I've taken you through over 20 years Um, of evidence, uh, the average success rate uh, published by multiple authors, uh, multiple surgeons in multiple states, multiple countries, shows an average success rate in excess of 90%. Um, uh, You're seeing uh, actually uh, complete transparency. Most of these studies uh, are also documenting any complications that can occur. Um, There are uh, evidence-based methods to diagnose trigger sites, and with good solid anatomy as a foundation, you're seeing a way to decompress these nerves and give benefit to patients, and most of all, hope. So with that, uh, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to uh, be a guest here on PRS Grand Rounds, and I look forward to the question. All right, Dr. Jan, thank you so much for that incredible lecture. I think everybody really enjoyed that. Before we move on to the questions, I do want to remind everybody who may have showed up a little bit late that we have classic pairings from PRS and PRS Global Open selected to complement this lecture that are available for free online at both journals' websites. Um, And Dr. Janice, why don't I go ahead and get you started with the first question from Dr. Um, Amjad Abubnami, who asked, do you have any advice for residents interested in building a practice that involves migraine surgery? Yeah, so that's a, a good question. So um, I'd, I'd may make it very brief. Number one, um, work with a neurologist. And you heard me already mention that before. Um, find a neurologist. And, uh, you know, again, in two different cities, in Dallas and Columbus, uh, I was able to do that. In some cases, you can look inside the institution that maybe you work if you work in an academic institution. But honestly, I found a lot of progress outside the institution. Um, I made appointments. I visited neurologist's office on their turf, on their terms, in their time. I presented my uh, business card. I told them a little bit about what I do. Uh, I told them I'm here for you uh, with these kind of patients. I also stayed in touch with them. Um, So for any time that I saw a patient of theirs in my clinic, um, I CC'd them on my note. If they didn't have the same medical record uh, uh, company as as I did, where I could just drop it into their in-basket, I faxed it to them. I also did that with my operation reports. I also um, emphasized that uh, I'm not here to steal the patients. And also at the end, I turned them back to their neurologist because oftentimes they're on medications um, that were prescribed by them. I'm not going to be the one to wean them off of those. That's going to be under the direction of the prescribing uh, provider um, or physician. I hate the word provider. Uh, so that that's the recommendations uh, that I would give is basically constructive, positive, and position yourself as somebody who doesn't do frontline uh, first treatment, but actually somebody on the back end. Looks like we have uh, some other um, questions here. Dr. Janice, if that's cut off, the question is, what do you think are the most tangible areas uh, in this field that can benefit from further research? Yeah, you know, uh, I'll tell you what I think. Um, 
I think that the next level on this is uh, probably looking at a broader definition of what we can treat with this type of technique. I think we've been calling it migraine surgery up to this point in time. Um, again, the diagnosis is not coming from plastic surgeons. It's coming from neurologists. And at least in my practice, you know, all of my, um, uh, all of my patients are coming from neurologists. I'm not seeing patients who don't come from neurologists. Um, so they carry the diagnosis. Um, but I do feel like, um, first of all, there is some genetic susceptibility uh, for these kind of headaches. And there's also these acquired headaches, post-traumatic, post-operative, um, and other reasons why patients can have nerve compression. So I think in the future, we're going to see more research on maybe nerve decompression surgery, which is why I crafted the title like that, not necessarily migraine surgery, because I think we need to think more global. I think it's going to be nerve decompression surgery rather than just migraine surgery. And let me see if there's any other questions here as I scout through this here. Um, here, Dr. Janice, one next question is, um, what do you think about the learning curve for these procedures? How long did it take for you to master them and how long do you think it takes somebody to learn them? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, uh, I, I first started doing this when I went and observed the surgery, which again, this is not something that was taught to me in residency. I started doing anatomical research in residency and started doing the clinical work when I got out, but nobody was doing migraine surgery in Dallas at the time. Um, so I think it was important for me to understand the concepts at the time. You know, I had an established relationship with Dr. Guyron. I went and visited with him. I kept in touch with him. We collaborate. Um, I think there is a learning curve. I think you have to familiarize yourself with the anatomy first. Um, and after the anatomy, then I think you need to observe the techniques, whether that's by video. Matter of fact, uh, for those of you that, uh, that don't know, um, at Plastic Surgery, the meeting, um, the Migraine Surgery Society, uh, which if anybody's interested in joining, by the way, I would uh, uh, tell you to visit the website uh, for Migraine so uh, Surgery Society, um, puts on a pre-conference symposium where we go through everything that you just saw in more detail. Um, we have a lot of dynamic Q&A. We have panel discussions. Um, we have cadaver labs. Uh, in the past, we've had live surgery. Um, so that is a great opportunity actually to get more information at uh, from an ASPS resource at Plastic Surgery the Meeting. And also, if for anybody that's interested in joining uh, the Migraine Surgery Society, would welcome you as a member. And of course, we have some resources we could provide to you as well. All right, our next question is from Rami Cantor. Um, how often are you performing these injections to have sustained relief for the Botox injections? And have you noticed any differences in responses based on any kind of demographic factors? Yeah, so uh, uh, I'll answer the second one first. I've not seen uh, any demographic differences, um, but I have. So if, if a patient responds to Botox, um, and you are accurate in how you're administering it, then we have seen longevity to the results. Um, now, technically, 5% of patients can uh, develop antibodies that can cause uh, the effect to wane. But in my clinical practice, again, that's based on other research. In my own clinical practice, I've not seen that. Um, we've seen patients sustained on this literally for years. Um, I can remember a patient of mine... Um, you know, several several patients will be denied uh, from surgery so they don't have access. I had one patient who had a liver enzyme deficiency, couldn't undergo general anesthesia, um, so she couldn't qualify for surgery, so we kept her on Botox. Um, there are other patients, you know, who will say, I want to stay on Botox for um, therapeutic reasons, not for diagnostic reasons, because the timing isn't right for surgery. Um, you know, they have events that are on the calendar. They can't afford to take time off from work. Uh, they can't afford to take the time off for recovery, et cetera. There may be many reasons why patients want to uh, stick with the injections. That's fine. Just realize that they can do that indefinitely, at least according to what we've published. And they can also not burn any bridges and sabotage their ability to qualify for surgery should they change their mind or times change. And if they want to get surgery, then they're certainly el eligible to do that. Great. Our next question is from Justin Bellamy. Uh, you mentioned CT scanning and other imaging and advanced imaging and diagnostic tools for some of these patients. How do you decide when to do those more advanced uh, 
diagnostic tools. Yeah, this will be a quick answer. I don't use CT scan, except if I'm evaluating the nasal trigger site. Um, you can do that uh, usually based on history. So if patients typically have early morning headaches, like when they wake up, um, or it's associated with a lot of sinusitis or sinus pressure in that area, um, if it's exacerbated by things like uh, seasonal allergies or menstrual cycles, which again, all can cause the engorgement of the nasal mucosa and cause septal deviation, turbine and hypertrophy, all of these things to uh, essentially cause uh, mucosal irritation because they're already kicked up against each other, septal spurs, et cetera, contrable. At that point, if I want to evaluate, I used to use a nasal speculum and a headlight. I found that to be um, not as productive as getting coronal CT scans that are three millimeter slices. Um, if I'm looking at a coronal scan, I can see the intranasal pathology very clear. Um, if this is a without contrast CT. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't get CT scans for other reasons. Um, there are some who may suggest that you could also get it for what's called site number one, which is the supraorbital supertrochlear trigger site uh, in order to evaluate preoperatively for the presence of a uh, supraorbital foramen, let's say, versus a notch. Um, I, it doesn't change my practice. I, that I can figure out when I get there. I, it doesn't change what I do. Um, but if I've already gotten a CT scan when I'm evaluating the nose, then I will look at that if I'm also operating on um, on the uh, supraorbital supertrochlear nerve to see, you know, in advance what I might expect, but I don't order it expressly to look for that. So it's it's actually a very narrow slice of patients that I order a CT scan on. Thanks for clarifying that. Our next question is from Marilla Sicano. What is your post-operative protocol for these patients, and do you maintain them on their pharmacologic therapies afterwards? Yeah, great question. So. Uh, I was saying earlier that these patients, you know, first of all, there's, I'm not going to get into it today, but there's different um, types of headaches, including medication overuse headache. And it's something that we talk about in our pre-conference symposium through the Migraine Surgery Society. So again, for those of you with more interest, we plan on having two neurologists, two board certified neurologists, one from San Diego, one from Houston uh, at this year's conference. And uh, we had them last year. It was fantastic. They talked about this phenomenon that's something that I'm going to let them manage, them being the neurologists, okay? Um, but these patients, uh, I do manage their acute post-operative pain. Um, you are operating on nerves, so um, they are at risk for having chronic pain. That's a part of the informed consent process. Um, I'll use multimodal analgesia. Um, first of all, uh, before the operation, um, I'll load them up with gabapentin. I'll start 600 milligrams the night before, then 300 milligrams the morning of. Um, I'll also associate that with 200 milligrams of celecoxib in those patients that don't have a heart history or a renal uh, problem. Uh, and by the way, I don't use gabapentin in patients who have obstructive sleep apnea on uh, CPAP because it has a, um, a, a a relative contraindication in those patients. Um, I'll also load them with 1.5 grams of liquid acetaminophen two hours prior to surgery. Um, uh, 1.5 gram dose basically helps overcome first pass hepatic metabolism. It's almost the equivalent of IV acetaminophen, which my institution doesn't have because it's too expensive. Um, so basically that's what I'll do preoperatively. Intraoperatively, um, I will give them eight milligrams of Decadron IV. I'll do that after they're asleep. For those of you that don't know, one of the uh, probably most uh, um, untolerated and unwanted side effects of a Decadron when given while awake is intense anal itching. Uh, so you probably don't want to do that unless you really don't like somebody. So I'll uh, give that at the beginning of the case after the patient's asleep. That'll help with anti-emetic, uh, anti-inflammatory, and pain management purposes. Uh, and then after surgery, uh, I will maintain them on a multimodal analgesia regimen of one gram of acetaminophen every six hours. Uh, gabapentin, usually um, uh, I'll go 300 three times a day uh, unless they're over 65 when it's twice a day. Uh, and celecox of 200 milligrams three times a day unless there's a contraindication. I'll continue that for 14 days and then wean them off. So I uh, hope I didn't get too detailed there. If you have any questions, of course, you can email me, jeffrey.janis at osumc.edu, um, or we've actually put out um, a publication that just came out a week ago uh, with Jenny Barker and Girish Joshi, who is an anesthesiologist I work with uh, down at, uh, at Parkland Hospital. And we put out in Global Open a practical review on pain management for plastic surgeons. So again, I draw your attention to PRS Global Open from last week. All right, thank you. 
Our next question is about uh, recurrent cases. Have you encountered any, and do you feel like there's pot the potential for scarring from these surgeries to result in re repeat compression? Yeah, so, you know, um, there's two reoperations. There's those on the same site and those on different sites. So I'll be brief. It's pretty rare to reoperate on the same site. Um, now, scar, scar tissue can form, uh, or I've had some instances where the patient has had great relief and then gotten into, let's say, a car accident where they were rear-ended, they had a whiplash effect, they had no pain after their original surgery, and then it came back after that incident. So that, I guess, is a recurrence in the same site, um, but it's for explainable reasons. Um, more common is a recurrence where patients have pain in a different site that wasn't originally targeted. And then you have to ask your question, well, did you miss it on the diagnostic side or did they develop it afterwards? I've actually seen both. Um, so again, I think you really got to sit down with these patients and understand. I referred earlier when you're asking them questions, are you getting these you know, uh, independently, or are they always related, implying that there's more than one trigger site um, at play here. Um, but more often than not, um, these patients are having recurrences in different sites. It's almost like your body is uh, trying to figure out a way around the surgery sometimes. Um, but th those are the things that I would look at. Question your own diagnosis up front, um, and also um, be aware that uh, trigger sites, secondary trigger sites, can develop in other places. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jans. This has been an amazing Q&A so far. I think we have time for one last question. Sure. What do you think is the best timing for referring a patient to you or to any plastic surgeon for a surgical treatment of their headaches? Uh, best time from the neurologist? Yes, I believe so. So, you know, I think, and again, like when, in in my opinion, uh, and I've said it before, and I think it's worth reemphasizing. Uh, I don't think like like I've had patients. Let me let me be more crystal on this. I've had patients come to see me that somehow got through my screening process, which requires um, a referral by a neurologist and the the um, documentation sent in advance, so I could be fully prepared for their visit. Um, I have had a few instances where patients have shown up. Um, I don't have that. Uh, they have not seen a neurologist. Uh, and then when it comes down to it, I don't treat those patients. I actually refer them to the neurologist. And I have a mutual back scratch with my neurologist where I'm, if you haven't, I mean, there was a neurologist um, uh, here in town when I first started that had a nine month wait list to be seen. Um, when you can have a baby faster than you can get uh, a, a visit to a new doctor, I don't know what ratio that's called, but that's 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 pretty unbelievable. So um, my arrangement with neurology is is that if I see somebody that I want to refer to my neurologist, they will see that patient within three weeks. And the converse is true, except it's two weeks. If that um, neurologist wants to refer a patient to me because they've tried everything and it hasn't worked, um, I will get that patient in within two weeks. Um, and, and that's, I, I think that ability to have a collegial relationship, um, expedited referral patterns and closure of the feedback loop and communication back to the referring physician, I think those are all going to be critical. I think the best time to, ref to refer the patient is when the neurologist feels like he or she needs you. All right. That's a, that's a great answer. So I think with that, we're going to wrap up Dr. Janice. We're running out of time. This has been an incredible talk and an amazing Q and a to remind everybody that joined us later. This video is recorded along with the Q and a, so you can watch this on your own time later as well. And we have accompanying articles online that you can read for free. So thank you again, Dr. Janice for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. It's an honor. I'm going to go shave and get a haircut. Well, I'll appreciate that. Yes, we will.